Hello and welcome to Africa Here and Now, the conversation you always wanted to have about the continent. I'm Martine Dennis. Today we're five months into the war on Gaza, and while there's talk of a ceasefire and hostage release, more than a million frightened, hungry Palestinians are cowering in tents in the south, close to the border with Egypt. So why is Cairo so resolute about not letting Palestinians in? Across the continent, people are howling at the pain incurred by the rising cost of living, none more loudly than Nigerians, where inflation has skyrocketed to around 30% and people understandably have been protesting. The distinguished political economist Kingsley Mogalu gives us his assessment and tells us what he thinks makes for a good African leader. And the 13th, Africa Games are due to begin in Accra. It's a prelude to this summer's Paris Olympics, but is this festival of African sport, already allegedly millions of dollars over budget, something heavily indebted Ghana can actually afford? And is the country even ready for the 4,000 athletes due to take part? Well, with me to go through these stories, as ever, are the journalist and political commentator Donu Kogbara, who's in the Nigerian capital Abuja, and from elsewhere, in deepest, darkest London, Patrick Smith, editor of Africa Confidential. Hello to you both. Greetings, Martine. Good to hear you. Hi. Right, let's start in the very north of Africa, where the seemingly never-ending plight of the Palestinians is very close to spilling over into Egypt. And this, the most deadly episode of violence for both Palestinians and Israelis since the birth of Israel in 1948, is having political ramifications around the world. How leaders respond to the violence in Gaza is having, in some cases, unforeseen consequences. The South Africans, they've received near universal praise for taking the allegation of genocide to the ICJ. Joe Biden's campaign for re-election in the States has been shaken by the significant number of Arab Americans' disapproval of his failure to call for a ceasefire, although Vice President Kamala Harris has finally made that call. And here in the UK, Parliament was reduced to farce when lawmakers merely tried to discuss Gaza. But let's look at Egypt, which borders southern Gaza, where more than a million Palestinians are huddled in a tiny patch of land, awaiting, with trepidation no doubt, a new Israeli offensive on Rafah. We can speak to Hafsa Halawa, an independent consultant and non-resident scholar at the Middle East Institute. She's joining us from Dubai. Hi, Hafsa. Really good to talk to you. Hi, Martine. Thanks for having me. I sort of outlined the, some of the ramifications that are being experienced politically around the world as a result of this conflict in Gaza. What are the particular potential consequences for Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, the Egyptian president, and his government? Thank you so much. And um, it's, I mean, initially, it's a major security issue, primarily. It's twofold in the sense that obviously the war in Gaza has direct ramifications on Egypt. The Houthis uh, blocking Red Sea trade is having a direct effect on trade in the Suez Canal and revenue for um, the country that is going through a, a destabilizing economic crisis. And of course, for the war itself, there is the greater question, um, not seemingly silenced by either American or Israeli officials on possible forced displacement of the Palestinian population into the Sinai Peninsula. For Egypt, that is much more than just an immediate security threat, both for the generals, the military regime, and for the people. It's much more of a question of identity after so many years since the 50s of fighting in various Arab-Israeli conflicts that ended with the Camp David Accords as agreed in 1979. Something this large, uh, if, if such a threat was to come to pass, would uh, would really put into question the last 40 years of, of supposed cold peace with the Israelis. Um, because, of course, Egypt is so significant, is such an important player in the entire region, but particularly on the issue of the Palestinians being the first Arab country to recognise Israel, and, as we've already established, it actually borders Gaza. But what is it that frightens the al-Sisi government most of all? Uh, the Sinai Peninsula has does have its own peculiar uh, economic and security problems, doesn't it? 
Absolutely. I think there are a multitude of factors involved in this. Obviously, on the surface, you have a long-term security or security instability and security in the Sinai Peninsula since Abdel Fattah al-Sisi came to power in 2013 with a low-level insurgency that's never really been extinguished. You have the questions of trade, of economy, uh, the general question of identity for Sinai Bedouins, who have long, even under the Mubarak regime for decades, been really sidelined and isolated from mainland uh, Egypt. Uh, and of course, you have the question of Egypt's role in the broader uh, Israeli-Palestinian uh, peace process, and itself seen not only as a protector of that peace process through having good relations with the Palestinians and having brokered peace with the Israelis, but also as a security buffer in a sense, in the sense that every time these various conflicts have emerged, uh, Egypt is seen as the primary uh, interlocutor with Hamas officials in Gaza, rather than those of the political brigades who are elsewhere, namely in Doha and Qatar. And really, I think, I think there are two things at play here. One is the very immediate threat of displacement of the Palestinians, even, I would argue, Israel expanding into the Sinai Peninsula, this question of buffer zones and the tunnels and all these issues that, that have been tacitly raised in different negotiation centers, and also the longer term uh, implications on Egyptian society, this idea of Egypt being the protector of the Palestinian cause, the protector of Palestinian rights would certainly be thrown into massive disrepute and question if we did see one 1.5 million Palestinians have no other option or inevitably be displaced outside of their lands. How much of a problem politically is it for the LCC regime that dealing with um, Hamas they're dealing with essentially a, an affiliate of the Muslim Brotherhood, which is a banned organization in Egypt. And one of the LCC regime's key aims is to, is to suppress political Islam. I don't think it really impedes anything. I mean, ultimately, aside from a sort of slight shift in policy in dealing with Hamas in the 2014 Israel-Hamas conflict, uh, we really haven't seen Egypt change its policy or its engagement with Hamas. Hamas has always had a bureau in Cairo that was not shut down, even after the designation, as you rightly mentioned in 2015, of the organization. Uh, when it comes to the broader question of political Islam, it's very much long been a policy of President Sisi to take the domestic policy and export it in foreign policy. That's the reason why you've had a cutting of ties with Turkey for so many years, the question of its alliances in Libya, even uh, one might argue to a certain extent in the early years of the uprising vis-a-vis -vis Sudan. But um, that has very much shifted. Uh, part of that is both Egypt's regional weakness because of its own economic decline, uh, the political rise in the region of the Gulf states, and the very nuanced shifts of relationships where it's no longer a whole of region approach. It's very much country by country. And we see that replicated in Sudan, where Egypt is very much allied, not just to Abdel Fattah Burhan and the, and the Sudanese armed forces, but also certain elements of the former regime under Omar Bashir. And that doesn't change vis-a-vis -vis Hamas either. Um, we were discussing this yesterday about the role of South Africa taking Israel to the International Court of Justice. Every time I've spent any time in, in Cairo, I get into discussions about Palestine. It's clearly an issue that really motivates people on the streets. How do they feel about an African country taking Israel to the ICJ and most of the Arab countries in the region remaining pretty constrained in their in their commentary on what's going on in Gaza. How does that? Well, Egypt play is on the an street? African country. I thought Egypt exactly. was an African country. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, and Egypt certainly likes to, 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 um, to identify itself as an African country. I think, um, well, there are two, two parts of this. Politically, obviously, the Arab League joined South Africa's uh, claim, and that kind of tends to lump them all in, and the seat of the Arab League uh, is in Cairo. And Egypt then joined the other petition that was made um, on the question of occupation and apartheid. But actually, broadly across this, uh, across socially, across people, there is nothing but pride and respect and support and love for South Africa and the position that it's took. There has always been historically significant anger uh, towards each iteration of Egyptian regimes, including that very limited uh, period of Mohamed Morsi's and the lack of real, uh, shall we say, moral stances against Israel and its regular incursions into Gaza, the besiegement, the role Egypt has played in, in, uh, in exacerbating the siege on Gaza for 16 years. That's no different now. I think, if anything, it's merely 
that South Africa's role and the support for South Africa's role only highlights just how angry Egyptians are. And there's a lot of social activism now on the streets. The boycott is in full swing. Uh, a lot of restaurants and cafes are now switching their, their logos to embrace uh, Palestinian, uh, either the kafia or the flag. There's very little the regime can do to stop that. And we've even seen, ir albeit irregular, but certainly sanctioned protests uh, that are calling out the entirety of the Arab region, all Arab states, not just Egypt, out for what they perceive as its complicity by remaining rather silent on their diplomatic ties with Israel. Okay, I was speaking to a senior European diplomat in Lagos the other day, and I asked him why the Western countries are, are not sort of demanding a ceasefire in um, this conflict. And he said off the record that a lot of them feel guilty because they know that, the, that they are partly responsible for the sort of like almost feral, feral desperate mindset of the Israelis. You know, it's, it's linked to the Holocaust and to centuries of treating Jews like Non, like rubbish, okay? So, okay, so that's their reason. What's the Arab country's reason? Are they just scared of Israel? I think it's more about the United States. This comes down to the fact that, you know, for me at least, and the way I interpret it, is the bedrock of, of US uh, sort of regional security is not necessarily in its alliance with Israel. It's more so in its alliance with Egypt, because that really opened the door for preceding years of building security relationships and alliances across the Arab states. There are a number of issues related to that. A lot of the uh, allied Arab states are now wholly dependent on the United States for their, um, uh, be it their territorial integrity, their security infrastructure and architecture. For some, such as the UAE, that includes Israel as well in that. And this is a region that has a proliferation of armed non-state actors. Sadly, and almost ironically, in the face of this gaining in legitimacy and strength as this war continues because of the in inaction of the, uh, of the governments across the region, and the broader question of uh, sort of non-Arab powers and their influence over Arab states, and here not just to speak of Israel and Iran, but also Turkey. This is a, a region that for the last more than, you know, the last 10, 12 years, the war in Syria has really de debilitated the, the region. The instability of uprisings across the region have failed to produce any kind of stability and security, in fact, raise the specter of insecurity. I have my personal views on, on that regarding democratization. But this is more about governments and regimes thinking very much in the near term and having very little forward planning and thinking about how to progress the issue to keep not only Palestinians within their own lands and progress on the question of a Palestinian state, but also the fact that they're simply not backed up by their traditional allies. The fact that Europe, as you rightly mentioned, hasn't even tried to step out of this sort of um, specter of US influence to see and expand on what it can do outside of US influence in the broader sort of global order keeps the Arab states even more, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, even more paralyzed in that sense than, than they would be in normal circumstances. They're not seeing that broad consensus of support. And so they're finding the opportunities in very narrow corridors, the ICJ and joining in joining South Africa's petition or raising the specter of the second petition of the ICJ on occupation and trying to find uh, routes whereby they can be present and be relevant in negotiations in a way they haven't been in other global forums such as the JCPOA or others that have heavily impacted their own national security. Hafsa Halawa talking to us from Dubai. Thank you so much. Now over to you, Patrick. What have you been looking at recently? What's grabbed your attention? Well, I've been um, watching what's been going on in the Congo, uh, particularly President Felix Tshisekedi's air miles. He, he took off last week for Luanda to meet President João Lorenzo, um, who is the mediator in the, the fight between Congo and Rwanda, or the, the proxy fight, because uh, on the ground in eastern Congo, the Congolese forces and their local allies are in conflict with the um, M23, the rebel militia which has been said to by the UN, the US government, now the French uh, government and the EU, to be backed by the Rwandan government. 
Um, the problem is uh, Chishikedi is saying that he's not going to enter into any negotiations with the M23 until, he, until he's got a, a meeting with Kagame. And before he has a meeting with Kagame, Kagame has got to admit that his troops are in the Congo and he's got to withdraw them. So it's, uh, it's, well, that's not going to happen. Really that's difficult. not going to happen, is it? Doesn't, doesn't look very likely. So uh, he spent three hours with um, Lorenzo in, in Luanda and then flew right directly to, um, to Brussels to, to meet the Belgian Prime Minister, Alexander de Croo, who, uh, unlike some of his European colleagues, is siding very, very strongly with uh, Chishikedi and, and saying that the EU should uh, not have negotiated. The, the EU has just negotiated a minerals deal with Rwanda. And de Croo took Chishikedi's side on that and said, look, um, until this conflict's resolved, you, you, sh you know, the EU shouldn't have made that decision. So it's getting messier. So there is a real danger that this, this, this conflict is going to escalate into the region. Mm, I think we're going to have to look a bit more closely at this, aren't we, in another programme. Patrick, thank you very much indeed. Now, lots of people have said to me, we tend to concentrate rather too much on Nigeria. Yes, we do, because it's the continent's largest economy. It's got the biggest population. I'm a, I'm, well, I've been told, usually by Nigerians, that one in every four Africans is a Nigerian. We're going to talk about the Nigerian economy because it's in a particularly precarious state. People have been out on the street, as I mentioned earlier. Inflation is skyrocketing, and I think the price of a bag of rice has doubled in the space of a year. Nigerians are not happy. So, Donu, why don't you introduce us to Professor Kingsley Mogalu? Okay, so Kingsley Mogalu is... Um one of the few Nigerian men I take seriously. Um, he ran for the presidency in 2019 and 2023. Um, in, and, you know, it was always obvious that he was too good for the sort of politics we, we play in Nigeria. Uh, play is the wrong word, really, because it's very feral and savage here. Um, he's too civilized. But I cannot tell you how many people would like Kingsley to become a main player on the political stage here. Uh, we actually go back a long way in terms of the Civil War and the role our fathers played, but that's not the story for today. The story for today is that Kingsley is a distinguished Nigerian, very good friend, and um, I'm really very pleased that he's come onto the program today. Why don't you tell us, do you think that uh, the the measures that have been put in place by the Tinubu government so far, which is causing so much angst on the streets of, of Nigerian cities, do you think that the, these are ill-advised or do you think that they are a good move and that Nigeria basically just has to suck up the pain? Well, thank you. First of all, thank you for having me. Thank you, Don, for the very kind words. Uh, thank you, Martin. Patrick, the reforms you know, the, mainly the removal of petrol subsidy and the subsidy on the Naira. Those were the two main things that have really happened that are called reforms. Um, have hit people really, really very hard. The problem with the reforms was not the notion, because I believe personally that they were always necessary. You know, Nigeria's subsidy regime was just a masterclass in fraud and corruption, you know. Um, and so, and so it, it simply became unsustainable, especially as the country's income from oil continued to decline. And that's partly because of huge amounts of oil theft, not to talk about the ebb and flow of the oil price. So the reforms, the problem with the reforms was the precipitate nature of their introduction. You know, President Tinubu um, announced the, the removal of subsidy uh, at his swearing in on the 29th of May, he did not have a cabinet in place. He did not have any uh, group of officials that people could identify as his economic team or advisors in place. Um, and so there was not proper thinking, in my own view, about the morning after. You know, um, you know when you when you when you do certain things, you, you've got to think about the morning after. There was no preparation, no things 
put in place to absorb the shock we were bound to, to, to have. Now, actually, there was no provision in the budget for subsidy after June 2023. And so some people would really argue, was this really a reform? I mean, there was already a law, uh, the Petroleum uh, Industry Bill and all that, that was going to make subsidy unsustainable. So, and on the Naira, um, they trying to, um, um, you know, create a unified exchange rate rather than a fixed exchange rate as the previous regime was trying to do uh, to maintain the, the strength of the Naira artificially. And again, that had become unsustainable because the country's foreign reserves were very weak. You know, so when they removed this support, again, um, the price of imports uh, you know, multiplied uh, hugely and that became a pass-through channel for massive inflation. In the country. So between these two things, life is very hard for Nigerians. People are angry and hungry. Um, the question is, what's the way out? But it was always a, a chronicle uh, or chronicle of a death foretold, in my view. And the question is, is, will there be a resurrection? And if so, what are the conditions on which a resurrection can take place? Um, how far is this a consequence of the external shocks that the global economy has suffered, the, uh, the, the recovery from the pandemic and, of course, the Russian war on Ukraine. I mean, how far is, that, is Nigeria just being battered by the same um, uh, currents that everyone else is? Quite significantly. I mean, the war in Ukraine has led to huge increases in the prices of grain imports. So that's, you know, and Nigerians consume a lot of grains and they use it to make bread. You know, and uh, the price of bread, as we know, is a matter for the streets. It, 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 it's very real for many poor income families. Um, the price of oil, of course, has also been buffeted. And COVID, you know, basically shut the world economy down and, um, you know, created massive crisis for global supply, supply chains. So, yes, Nigeria has also been very hit. But I believe if I were to measure the impact of local and global factors, I would say local 70 or 75, global 20 or 25. The major reason Nigeria is, an economic, is in an economic crisis today is because of the failure of Nigeria's leaders to manage the economy and because of the endemic nature of corruption in the Nigerian uh, governance uh, universe. Hi, Kingsley. Um what I wanted to find out from you is how far you think this economic crisis is going to turn into a, a political crisis. We've heard reports now of, of looting breaking out in uh, some of the northern states of the country. There were, last week, there were a couple of big demonstrations by trade unions in, in some of the southern cities, and I think in Abuja too. People are really, really very hungry because the inflation of the price of foodstuff is huge. So that's really hitting rock bottom for many, many people. And so it's already a political crisis because, as you might know, most of Tinubu's uh, votes came from the northern part of the country. And so but that part of the country, incidentally, is much poorer than the rest of the country. And so they're feeling the heat a lot more. And so some of them are saying, you know, they're protesting, we gave you our votes and now we're going hungry. So yes, it's already a political crisis. And if, if it continues, the political crisis will widen. Already there are some protests in the Southwest where Tinubu comes from. Uh, but the Southeast, um, you know, where I come from, has basically shrugged and said, we're not having any part of all these demonstrations. Where it's just you guys sort it out. Um, and the reason they're saying that is because they feel that they've been shortchanged a lot in Nigeria and nobody cared. So why should anybody be looking for their support to demonstrate for or against anybody now? And so um, we survived the civil war. Situation, the situation was a hundred times worse than it is today. Now, what can the government do? The government is already beginning to do certain things because, you see, part of the problem is the loss of investor confidence. Um, investors just have fled the country. Uh, and the key to beginning a solution in the short term is to stabilize the precipitous collapse of the Naira, uh, the Naira's value vis-a-vis -vis the dollar, the US dollar. Um, and that's the battle that the central bank is waging to the death. And they seem to have, um, you know, be prepared to fall on their sword on the matter of the exchange rate. We've also seen 
some surreptitious, allegedly, return of some form of subsidy. Because the landing cost of imported petrol in Nigeria today is a thousand naira, but the price at the pump is still about six to seven hundred naira. So obviously, something is happening somewhere, and the full market realities are not being. So that's one of the measures that maybe the government is taking, but out of public view, in order to be able to control public anger uh, and prevent a further escalation of prices. Uh, on the uh, naira front, the central bank has just hiked monetary policy rates by 400 basis points. Points. That's 4%. Um, now, that will hit the businesses very hard, but it will begin to control the money supply. Because one of the mistakes this government made, although the crisis, the foundation for the crisis was laid by the previous government, no question about it, but one of the mistakes the current government made was to announce the so-called floating of the Naira um, in a loose monetary environment. You see? stronger economic technocratic competence would have argued for uh, jacking up interest rates at the same time as you were making this announcement. Because investors don't like a highly inflationary environment. Um, and when, there's a, when there are loose monetary conditions, the Naira is just sloshing all around. So politicians get a lot of it from the removal of the subsidies. States are getting more money and they head straight to the Bureau de Change to buy dollars. And this creates a massive pressure, demand pressure on the dollar, and keeps the Naira sinking and the dollar rising. So um, the central bank is now beginning to take some measures to control the money supply. I know that you are working on a Pan-African level to look into measures in intra-African trade that we hope will impact positively on Nigeria as on other countries. But you, before you tell us about that, I just want to talk about the international level. Now, as yes. you know, I am quite illiterate around economics, so um, I'm going to ask you a question that you may think is ridiculous. But That's since okay. since the pound, <laughs> the dollar, well, you're used to it where I'm concerned anyway. <laughs> so since don't, the pound, don't reveal everything. Since the pound, the dollar, and... <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, so since the pound, the dollar, and the euro <clears throat> will buy so much more in Nigeria, okay? So, yes. like, if you have one pound now, you know, it, you're a millionaire in Nigeria, more or less, okay? So, yeah. isn't that good for international business? I mean, if they want to invest in Nigeria, they can yes. build a local factories and hire local people for peanuts, so shouldn't that attract inward investments? Not really, because it's, it's not the exchange rate that's the issue. It's the instability of the exchange rate, and it's the instability of prices. So, and investors don't like unstable environments. Um, and so, yes, even though the Naira is cheap, um, but it's unstable, and investors have to repatriate their profits and so they cannot plan in an unstable environment. And so they, they don't like that. Now, if Nigeria also were a more productive country in an export sense, in the sense that they were producing a lot of valuable goods with value added and exporting, then um, a devaluation of the Naira will be beneficial to Nigeria because the people will you know, buy more Nigerian goods. But the 80% of what Nigeria exports is oil. And so they don't benefit anything from the devaluation of their currency. It just imports inflation. That's what happens because it's an import-dependent economy. So that's why um, it doesn't quite work out the way you might think it should. If it were South Korea, I mean, there are countries that devalue their currency competitively. China does it sometimes, South Korea, Japan, you know, because it makes their exports cheaper and they get a lot more money in. But we're not exporting anything of value. Which brings me to the question you asked about intra-African trade. Now, I believe that this is the path to prosperity for Africa. Um, we trade too much with the rest of the world and too little with ourselves on the continent. Whereas, when you look at the world, you will see that every prosperous region, every prosperous continent, trades far more within themselves than with the rest of the world. Let me give you some figures. 70% of all of Europe's trade is within Europe. 60% of all of Asia's trade is within Asia. 40% of North America's trade is within North America. 
only uh, 14 or 15 percent of Africa's trade is within Africa. Now, when you consider the fact that what is it that Africa trades in and how does Africa trade, you will see that this puts Africa at a very big disadvantage because what we trade in is raw commodities, natural resources, not value-added goods. That's that we sell to the world raw materials and they sell us valued value-added goods and that puts us at a disadvantage in global trade because 70% of global trade is based on value-added or what we call global value chains now. So, so that's why we're telling Africans that we need to create, you know, there's uh, the new African Continental Free Trade, Free Trade Agreement, the AFTA. Um, and that is a platform on which Africa can rise to prosperity because it makes us the world's biggest free trade area now. And we can trade between ourselves and our countries um, without tariffs, you know, without uh, all kinds of uh, walls going up between us. That's what that agreement does. But for that agreement to be able to create prosperity for the average small and medium enterprise, the woman who's trading across the border between Nigeria and across the Seme border, between Nigeria and Benin Republic, the business environment has to be conducive. It's not. There's a lot of corruption at Africa's borders. So you go across to trade and customs officials take half of your profits. You know, inside our countries, there's no stability. You know, uh, the governance systems are weak. The rule of law is not strong. So the business environment that will drive prosperity in Africa does not exist. And that's the role that the Africa Private Sector Summit, which I am the chairman uh, of the board, is playing now to get African leaders to adopt um, a private sector bill of rights that guarantees an enabling business environment for business in our continent. A lot of people think that the continental yes. free trade area isn't going to really work until the big economies, such yes. as Nigeria and South Africa, get it together and, and start trading no, no. with each other seriously. Yes. Maybe, you know, just saying, right, no tariffs between yes. Nigeria and South Africa from now on. Let's see ourselves as one big economy. Yes. What's, what's wrong with that Absolutely. as a way of sort of driving forward the continental no, no. project? Everything is right with it, and that's where it should be going. I mean, we've already started, we've seen a test uh, of, uh, between South Africa and Kenya, um, you know, of exports of goods, tariff-free, and all of that. that. That just needs to widen, and Nigeria has a very key role to play in, in the African continent of free trade area because it's the biggest market in the continent. Kingsley, can I take you back to politics a little bit? Because I know that you've turned your back on it. Um, for now. But I can remember when you were running for president and I said to you, do you think Nigeria is ready for an Igbo president? You're, a, you're of the Igbo group. You come from the eastern part of the country. Um, and obviously you thought that it was a distinct possibility. But um, other people that I speak to, other Nigerians say, no way, it's not going to happen. Do you think that this is a, a, a problem that Nigeria can overcome, this tribalism? Because that's what it is. Uh, yes, Nigeria does face a problem of extreme tribalism, and that is preventing the country from fulfilling its promise. Uh, the country is many nations in a country, but not yet a nation state. And that's because we have not, um, uh, as a matter of course, had leaders who promoted a nationalistic vision, a worldview, um, you know, that is beyond the sum, uh, you know, the, the, the parts of the sum. Um, that is beyond our tribes, uh, but something more noble. And let's have a common vision of our destiny and how to get there. That's what is lacking in Nigeria, because Nigeria's politics so, focus uh, in, so in, much on politics. So what you're saying is that Nigeria lacks a, a, a national identity. Is that what you're saying? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it, it, it happens when there's a football match. Anytime there's a soccer match, you'll see Nigerians united as never before across tribes, across religions. Soccer is the only unifying factor in Nigeria. And that's just a tragedy because soccer doesn't put bread on the table, unfortunately. And uh, finally, I think, Kingsley, um, I'd like to ask you about the qualities of leadership. What do you think are the main qualities uh, that Africa needs uh, in its leaders? Um, I would suggest, uh, straight off, I would suggest uh, a vision. Absolutely. Vision is the essential 
requirement for effective and transformative leadership. Um, the ability to uh, inspire, the ability to motivate, the ability to set your eyes on a higher mountain uh, beyond the self, beyond the tribe, beyond the religions, beyond the vested crony interests. So I would say that you know, for leadership in Africa to work, you know, African leaders must stop worshiping the gods of small things. Kingsley Mogali, thank you. Thank you for talking to us on Africa Here and Now. Thank you very much for having me. And so to the 13th Africa Games taking place in Accra quite soon. And there's only one person, therefore, to talk to. That's Gary Al Smith, sports pundit extraordinaire and a friend of the podcast. Welcome back, Gary. How are you doing? Doing well, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. Not at all. Now start by telling us what's going on. It's a big festival of African sport uh, getting underway. Is, is Ghana ready? So the opening ceremony is supposed to be on Friday, March the 8th. Then the games were supposed to start yesterday. So, yeah, a couple begun, but a couple also didn't begin uh, because some of the venues are not ready. So they had to postpone them to, you know, dates yet to be determined. But um, as of Saturday evening, 15 countries had touched down in, in Accra, with Ghana being the 16th. And I'm sure as of yesterday, more countries had come into their country but the build-up to the games have been fraught with the Ghanaian media I mean bearing down on the on the government on readiness and stuff like that because uh, most of the the country had been um, warning the government that we are in no position you know to host these games but the government said they are adamant they've done and lucky for this podcast just about an hour ago there was a press briefing which gave us the numbers to how much had been spent for the game. Tell us, what are the numbers? <laughs> right, so um, it says that the total cost of infrastructure for the games, according to the minister, $195 million. $195 million. Oops, that sounds like rather a lot for a heavily indebted country like Ghana. And, and wasn't this is only infrastructure, mind you. Just and the infrastructure, what does that mean? Does that mean sort of buildings and... Yes, three track, three velodromes. Yeah, all that stuff. And these are only for three newly built, so we are not even talking the refurbished ones. What was the established uh, budget that they were supposed to be working to? It was far lower, right? Yeah, oh yeah, far lower, about 15 million. And this is an election year, isn't it? So no wonder the media is all over this. Um, how, is, how is the government faring then uh, with, with this kind of level of scrutiny? Well, first of all, the games were supposed to be held last year. So the name is Accra 2023. It was supposed to be held last year, but the government asked for a stay of, you know, basically postponement to be able to put it together this year. And then believe it or not, they needed the IMF monies that were coming into the country to be approved for some of the monies going to be used for, you know, the other important things that we need. So I'm a sports journalist. I'm happy about the infrastructure. But if the games end this month and the following day, my education for my kids is not great, my health care is not great, the roads I'm on are not great, those things are far more important than the pursuit of sporting glory, you know. So, so yeah. and is is this is this how many Ghanaians feel? They feel that the government the government has has been ill advised in taking on this massive uh, project when it hasn't got any money. Yeah, but we are used to it here because I mean, um, in two days we are going to have our Independence Day. We are going to be sixty seven. Yay! <laughs> but guess what? There's a news article from two years ago where the president and the finance minister promised to. Um, commission a new national cathedral right a new national cathedral yes that is yes. two days from today on the 6th of march 2024 and they were making a whole lot of noise now they broke down some of the most in the most like plush residential area of accra um government buildings that had only been put up if i'm not mistaken only within the last 10 years for judges they broke all of them to make way for this national cathedral Sir David Ajayi, the very illustrious um, architect. architect. Yes. Exactly. Mm. So he was supposed to be the one to put it together and everything. And he brought an, a humongous budget for just the drawings and stuff like that. So 
everything, everything for that National Cathedral went to over a hundred million dollars after a hue and cry. And the IMF came and said, this should be one of the first things that you cancel because this is in no way any priority. They had broken down all the buildings in this prime area of Accra, which is in the same area as the Accra International Conference Center, the National Stadium, and now it was a hole. So they had made the hole ready to begin the foundation. That is when the IMF came and said, stop, you can't do this. So as we speak, we call it in Ghana, the world's most expensive hole. That's what we call it. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was the point of the whole thing? I mean, it's not even a centenary. Exactly. You know? So the president said when he became president, this was going to be his, I need to emphasize, this was going to be his monument of thanks to God. Gary, um, on, so, yeah. on, the, on the sports funding issue you raised, you know, said, look, you're, you're a great sports fan, but you're saying that, you know, social imperatives, education, health must take priority, right? Um, what route forward is there for, for funding Africa sports? Because, I mean, this lack of money, lack of training, lack of facilities is, is really holding back the continent. What about the, the businesses stepping up with some money of their own? Well, in my experience, Patrick, in many, many, many African countries, businesses will not be averse to doing it so long as they can see that there is prudence in spending. Okay, so let's just take this podcast. As assume that this podcast makes a profit of $10 per episode. The government comes <laughs> and optimistic. says, let's just say, okay. yeah, <laughs> let's just say $10 per episode, just a profit. And the government then says that, you know what? We want to make more great podcasts for this for the next generation. And so just give us a dollar a month and we are going to buy podcast equipment for journalism schools so that the next generation can also produce their podcast. Just so that we can be, you know, we can be transparent. We are going to bring you invoices and receipts or go and set it up so that you see it and we are going to give it to an independent regulator. I don't think anybody on this podcast, knowing the importance of something like this, is going to blink. And it's the same story with businesses. In places like South Africa, where it has worked in the past, you see, that is why cricket has such a big... Because, you know, the corporates who do it can see that their monies are going into something and infrastructure that is there. So, like, they know exactly what is going to be used for. And there's no problem. But for the rest of Africa, that's not the, the case. So, for example, everybody is happy that, okay, you have a new, you have new facilities here in Ghana, but if you put on the internet right now, the comment you are going to see is, ah, oh, give them eight months, we are going to see these places rotting. And, you know, they, they're all going to become white elephants. Now, to answer your question directly in just 30 seconds, the easy cop-out, the laziest cop-out that we know that countries like the UK did for... London 2012 is what? Using the national lottery. It's so easy. So we know that in every country, the national lottery is always going to be subscribed. Just put just a fraction of it into a sporting budget. Appoint an independent regulator that the government cannot touch. So take any country at all in Africa, let's say Gambia. And we know that in Gambia, for example, for example, wrestling is the number one sport. Football is the second sport, for example. Then you say, well, everybody knows wrestling is the first sport. So the 2%, out of the 2% that we are taking out of the national lottery money, that is basically free money, we are going to give 40% of that to wrestling, 40% of that to boxing. We are going to give independent regulators and make sure that the money is put to good use. And, you know, it has worked in so many countries. But of course, in Africa, it's the simple thing is complicated because... That takes the money out of government hands and they can't have that. All right. Can we get back to the sport, Gary? What, yeah, what, should, sure. what should we be looking out for? Um, what, are the, what are the highlights likely to be? Because, of course, this is a, um, a qualifying venue, isn't it, for some disciplines for the yes. Olympics in Paris in the summer? It is. It is indeed. So there are 23 disciplines that are going to be contested for 23. Eight. Only eight of them are going to be Olympic qualifiers. Only eight. Right, another eight are going to be medal um, disciplines. They're going to be medals, but not Olympic qualifiers. And then the others are going to be what they call demonstration sports. Obviously, the track and field events are going to take um, some some prominence. Unfortunately, because this is Africa, travel is a big big issue. So, for example, I'm hearing that the Kenyan government 
will not be able to fund some of the best athletes to come over to Ghana because of budgeting purposes. So that's the story for a lot of the other events that are going to be here. So I wouldn't be able to tell you that, hey, look out for this event and this event because sadly, some of the top, top athletes will not be making an appearance. But of course, the football will always be great. The men's and women's football, all the top countries that play will be able to come. And what about swimming? Is there a swimming discipline? Because um, I was thinking fondly of Eric the Eel. Do you remember him from Equatorial I him Guinea? From the Olympics. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And um, um, he, he was he got ten out of ten really for for um, endeavour, didn't he? Poor thing. But you remember his story of endurance and endeavour, right? I mean, he had so little access to swimming and infrastructure and equipment that he was swimming in crocodile infested waters <laughs> i actually saw the hotel swimming pool in which he practiced in malabo oh. and it was it was like a big paddling pool really so i felt 20 I felt meters. Very... it was only 20 meters <laughs> yes i felt very yes, sorry yes, yes. so so that's the that's the story around africa and there are lots of black people like in the us and elsewhere who are tall who have what they call the ectomorph body you know they are long-limbed and they choose to go to sports like basketball. You know why? Because in their black communities, like in the UK, like Brixton, and in the US, like Brooklyn, where you have a lot of these champions coming from, they do not have access to things like swimming pools. So that's a simple reason. And instead of wasting their time to go to like the next 20 kilometers, they'd rather come from school and have a ball to play in, in, in basketball, which is why they gravitate toward. So that's the simple reason. West Africa has some of the best swimmers when it comes to black Africa. However, there are no Olympic sized swimming pools and stuff like that. And so they'd rather all channel their efforts to things that are easy like football. So that's the reason. Thank you very much, Gary, as ever. Yeah, sure. This is always such a treat to talk to you. Thanks, Gary. Well, that's it for this edition of Africa Here and Now. We're an independent podcast. We haven't got any ads or sponsorship. So if you like what we're doing, please consider making a donation so we can continue the conversation. You can do that on our website, www.africaherenow.com. There you can also listen to our episodes and find out a little bit more about us. We're on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and wherever you get your podcasts. I'm on X, formerly Twitter, or you can email me, martine at africaherenow.com. Let me know what you like, what you'd like more of, etc. We recorded this on Monday, the 4th of March, 2024. Our producer is Anne Busby, with the help of Tyler Hilton. Our original music is by Enric Adam. Anna DeWolf Evans put it all together. Our thanks to our guests, Hafsa, Kingsley and Gary, from Donu, Patrick and me. Thank you for your company.